Consider again that pale blue dot we've been talking about. Imagine that you take a good long look at it. Imagine you're staring at the dot for any length of time. And then try to convince yourself that God created the whole universe for one of the 10 million or so species of life that inhabit that speck of dust. Now take it a step further. Imagine that everything was made just for a single shade of that species, or gender, or ethnic or religious subdivision. If this doesn't strike you as unlikely, pick another dot. Imagine it to be inhabited by a different form of intelligent life. They too cherish the notion of a God who has created everything for their benefit. How seriously do you take their claim? How lucky for us that the sun, the moon, the planets, and the stars are part of some elegantly configured cosmic clockwork. It seemed to be no accident. They were put here for a purpose, for our benefit. Who else makes use of them? What else are they good for? And if the lights in the sky rise and set around us, isn't it evident that we're at the center of the universe? These celestial bodies, so clearly suffused with unearthly powers, especially the sun, on which we depend for light and heat, circle us like courtiers fawning on a king. Even if we had not already guessed, the most elementary examination of the heavens reveals that we are special. The universe seems designed for human beings. It's difficult to contemplate these circumstances without experiencing stirrings of pride and reassurance. The entire universe made for us. We must really be something. This satisfying demonstration of our importance, buttressed by daily observations of the heavens, made the geocentrist conceit a transcultural truth. Taught in the schools, built into the language, part and parcel of great literature and sacred scripture. Dissenters were discouraged, sometimes with torture and death. It is no wonder that for the vast bulk of human history, no one questioned it. Aristotle, Plato, St. Augustine, St. Thomas Aquinas, and almost all the great philosophers and scientists of all cultures over the 3,000 years ending in the 17th century bought into this delusion. Some busied themselves figuring out how the sun, the moon, the stars, and the planets could be cunningly attached to perfectly transparent crystalline spheres, the big spheres, of course, centered on the earth, that would explain the complex motions of the celestial bodies so meticulously chronicled by generations of astronomers. And they succeeded. With later modifications, the geocentric hypothesis adequately accounted for the facts of planetary motion as known in the second century and in the 16th. From there, it was only a slight extrapolation to an even more grandiose claim that the perfection of the world would be incomplete without humans, as Plato asserted in the Timaeus. Man is all, the poet and cleric John Donne wrote in 1625. He is not a piece of the world, but the world itself, and next to the glory of God, the reason why there is a world, said John Donne. And yet, never mind how many kings, popes, philosophers, scientists, and poets insisted on the contrary. The earth through those millennia stubbornly persisted in orbiting the sun. You might imagine an uncharitable extraterrestrial observer looking down on our species over all that time, with us excitedly chattering, the universe created for us, we're at the center, everything pays homage to us, and concluding that our pretensions are amusing, our aspirations pathetic, that this must be the planet of the idiots. But such a judgment is too harsh. We did the best we could. There was an unlucky coincidence between everyday appearances and our secret hopes. We tend not to be especially critical when presented with evidence that seems to confirm our prejudices. Philosophy and religion caution that the gods, or God, 
were far more powerful than we, jealous of their prerogatives and quick to mete out justice for insufferable arrogance. At the same time, these disciplines had not a clue that their own teaching of how the universe is ordered was a conceit and a delusion. This worried them not at all. That some of their deeply held beliefs might turn out to be mistakes was a possibility hardly considered. Doctrinal humility was to be practiced by others. Their own teachings were inerrant and infallible. In truth, they had better reason to be humble than they knew. Every other proposal, and their number is legion, to displace us from cosmic center stage has also been resisted, in part for similar reasons. We seem to crave privilege, merited not by our works, but by our birth, by the mere fact that, say, we're humans and born on Earth. We might call it the anthropocentric, the human-centered conceit. This conceit is brought close to culmination in the notion that we are created in God's image, the creator and ruler of the entire universe looks just like me. My, what a coincidence. How convenient and satisfying. The 6th century BC Greek philosopher Xenophanes understood the arrogance of this perspective. Here's what he said. The Ethiopians make their gods black and snub-nosed. The Thracians say theirs have blue eyes and red hair. Yes, and if oxen and horses or lions had hands and could paint with their hands and produce works of art as men do, horses would paint the forms of the gods like horses and oxen like oxen. How much more satisfying had we been placed in a garden custom-made for us, its other occupants put there for us to use as we saw fit? There is a celebrated story in the Western tradition like this, except that not quite everything was there for us. There was one particular tree of which we were not to partake, a tree of knowledge. Knowledge and understanding and wisdom were forbidden to us in this story. We were to be kept ignorant. But we couldn't help ourselves. We were starving for knowledge, created hungry, you might say. This was the origin of all our troubles. In particular, it's why we no longer live in a garden. We found out too much. So long as we were incurious and obedient, I imagine, we could console ourselves with our importance and centrality and tell ourselves that we were the reason the universe was made. As we began to indulge our curiosity, though, to explore, to learn how the universe really is, we expelled ourselves from Eden. Angels with a flaming sword were set as sentries at the gates of paradise to bar our return. The gardeners became exiles and wanderers. Occasionally, we mourn that lost world, but that, it seems to me, is maudlin and sentimental. We could not happily have remained ignorant forever. There is in this universe much of what seems to be design. Every time we come upon it, we breathe a sigh of relief. We're forever hoping to find, or at least to safely deduce, a designer. But instead, we repeatedly discover that natural processes, collisional selection of worlds, say, or natural selection of gene pools, or even the convection pattern in a pot of boiling water, can extract order out of chaos and deceive us into deducing purpose where there is none. In everyday life, we often sense, uh, in the bedrooms of teenagers or in national politics, that chaos is natural and order imposed from above. While there are deeper regularities in the universe than the simple circumstances we generally describe as orderly, all that order, simple and complex, seems to derive from laws of nature established at the Big Bang, or maybe earlier, rather than as a consequence of belated intervention by an imperfect deity. God is to be found in the details, is the famous dictum of the German scholar Abbe Warburg. 
but amid much elegance and precision, the details of life in the universe also exhibit haphazard, jury-rigged arrangements, and much poor planning. What shall we make of this? An edifice abandoned early in construction by the architect? The evidence so far at least, and laws of nature aside, does not require a designer. Maybe there's one hiding, maddeningly unwilling to be revealed. Sometimes it seems a very slender hope. The significance of our lives and our fragile planet is then determined only by our own wisdom and courage. We are the custodians of life's meaning. We long for a parent to care for us, to forgive us our errors, to save us from our childish mistakes. But knowledge is preferable to ignorance. Better by far to embrace the hard truth than a reassuring fable. If we crave some cosmic purpose, then let us find ourselves a worthy goal.